Welcome. I'm Kinetic Symphony. I hunt down and report on weird and true mysterious stories, from glitches to the paranormal. Would you like even more content? Here's my Patreon. Now onto the stories. Caisson Sofa 1286, written by Joyce's Raven 13. A physicist's perspective on quantum immortality. I've always been confident of my experiences and observations. That's been something about myself I've always liked. There are plenty of things that I'm awful at, but I've built a career in anthropology on observing things other people don't see until I pointed them out, and I trust my perceptions. Despite this innate confidence, however, it has been validating to find out that other people have had the I died and jump timelines experience, too. My own experience finds its seeds in the absolute worst period of my life, an 18th month span that started in the spring of 2015. I'd been through hard times as a homeless youth after having to leave home and school at 16, but just before the events that exploded in 2015, I was having a good life. I was married to someone I loved deeply, I had a great career, great friends, and enjoyed volunteering for my community by teaching martial arts to survivors of DM violence and running a special needs animal sanctuary on my land. Unfortunately, over the course of this 18 month span, both of my parents were diagnosed as terminal with rare and terrible brain conditions. I started caring for them, traveling constantly to take my mom to chemo in another state and helping my dad find new ways to communicate as he lost his ability to speak. In the midst of this, my wife left me for a student of mine whom she'd been having an affair with. Crushingly, my service dog had to be put down a week after my wife left, after she had an intractable seizure. Then, the worst thing happened, or the worst two things I suppose. My dad died and I was assaulted the same night by someone who was supposed to be there to support me. The assault was so bad that I had to have two surgeries and I ended up literally losing parts of myself. I included all of this to give context to the next part. The day after I got home from my second surgery, I remember only two things. The first was posting on social media that I needed to place all the animals at my sanctuary. The last was smiling strangely at myself in the bathroom mirror later that day. Then nothing. I woke up late the next day, around 4pm, sicker than I have ever been. I had the worst headache ever and I started vomiting. I pushed myself along the floor to the bathroom. For quite a while, an hour or two, maybe more, I laid on the bathroom floor, unable to move. I finally got up and lunged my way to the kitchen, thinking that I needed to hydrate or I wasn't going to make it confused as to why I felt so awful. As I dizzily tried to stand and clumsily grabbed a glass from the cupboard, I saw it. There on the kitchen counter was an empty bottle of the strong pain medication that had been full when the hospital sent it home with me after my surgery the day before. I had a horrible, sinking feeling. I realized that I had taken the whole bottle. There had been 60 pills. I immediately thought that there was no way I could have lived through taking that many pills Yet there I stood. The fact that I didn't even remember doing it was alarming. It did explain the nausea and headache and being out of it to the point that I couldn't even care for the animals, which never happened even if I had to crawl. I was shocked. Yes, I had been through hell over the last months, losing so much. But in addition to the 26 animals that I loved dearly and who depended on me, I was still very close to my sister and had a grown child who meant the world to me. I would never have consciously made a decision to end things. Nevertheless, the proof that I had reached a limit to what I could handle sat there on the counter, the empty bottle staring at me like a dead eye, open wide. In the immediate aftermath of this event, I felt like I had inexplicably dodged a bullet, defying death. I went to counseling and found other supports for my grief and exhaustion. I tried to get back to a semblance of normality. However, things never did feel right. The people who've experienced quantum immortality know exactly what I'm talking about. There was an undeniable dissonance between me and what was supposed to be my life. I knew that something had drastically shifted, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Nothing seemed real. It wasn't dissociation, 
It was like I had suddenly been set down a whole different life, one that was thinner. I use that term because it almost feels like I was a ghost. I remember that the thought started pushing into my mind that I hadn't dodged a bullet, but that I had actually died that fateful day and was living in some sort of second reality. Not knowing about quantum immortality at this point, I did research on believing that you are dead and found out that there is a very rare condition in which people inexplicably believe they are dead and slowly rotting away. I think it's called Cotard Syndrome. I didn't feel like I was dead exactly, and I didn't feel like my body was decomposing, but I grasped at the idea that maybe that was what was going on with me. It wouldn't be surprising if my mind was off kilter after all that had happened. I just needed time. It slowly became clear though that it was far more than that. At first, it was small things. I didn't remember certain events or interactions or remember them the right way according to friends and acquaintances. I realized that I felt differently about people I had known for a long time, more positively or more negatively. My tastes and preferences changed. Still, I knew that a near-death experience could cause changes in personality, so I continued to push away the idea that I had somehow jumped into another timeline to the periphery. Push it away as I might though, an awareness that something foundational had shifted was beginning to override traditionally rational assessments. Though I had kept it to myself, and even continued to try to contain it in my subconscious, I started thinking in terms of my prior life being on one timeline and the one I'm living now being on a different one. As I leaned into finding happiness despite this undercurrent of disruption, I got together with someone I had a deep attraction toward over several decades. In my lifetime before, we had never had an opportunity to date because we were always out of sync and dating other people whenever our lives crossed paths. But in this timeline, we were both free when we ran into each other again and we finally had our chance. I remember thinking to myself that maybe this is why I switched timelines to have the relationship with her that we had always been meant to have, though I kept that buried in my private thoughts. It was during the early part of our relationship that the first major jolt occurred that forced my buried thoughts to the surface. I knew something was profoundly and irrefutably off when I mentioned to her the trip she and I took to see my family 15 years before. She looked at me like I was from Neptune. She had no memory of the trip at all. She said I must be thinking about the trip that we took right before she left for college when we were kids, when we had taken an initial trip to introduce her to my family when I first fell for her. But the second trip I was talking about occurred when we were in our 30s and 40s. At that time, our lives had come together unexpectedly again, and we had contemplated dating, as she was in an open relationship and my relationship just prior had ended. The purpose of the second trip was to reintroduce her to my family after so many years and for her and I to have a chance to talk about our possible future. I remember her getting into my family's town on the train, how nervous I was, picking her up, what she wore over the course of the trip, the products that she was using at the time, for example, a rose water spray for her face. I remember the special and specific dishes that my mom had made for us. My mom's cooking history is very distinct as people in the family changed their dietary needs and convictions over the years. I even remember that this woman was not used to eating the kinds of foods my mom made and got a terrible stomach ache. She had laid on the floor and put her legs up on a particular post in her house to try to alleviate the cramping as I did what I could to help her feel better. I remember the exact spot where we made out on the hill next to my parents' house and exactly everything we talked about as we were sitting there, as it was the first time I'd kissed her and it was obviously a memorable moment. I remember timing things so that I could ride the train back with her when she left. I remember the train ride home with her on the second trip and how there was hardly anyone on the train, so we each got to spread out and have our own seats. After the first trip, she left alone and I traveled to Illinois with my mom. We talked long and seriously about starting a relationship but made the decision that the timing wasn't right as my son was still quite young and needed my full attention. Though she remembers our lives crossing paths again at the time, she had no memory of the second trip and all of the things that transpired during it. She kept insisting that I must be remembering the first trip 
Despite my ability to reel off all kinds of distinguishing details about the second trip that proved it had to have happened later, I kept telling her that the first trip was quite distinct in my memory, and our memories matched in regard to the details of the first trip. All to no avail. We simply had different memories. Further, my family had no memory at all of her making that second trip to see them, either. Her sister, who she shares everything with, also has no memory of the second trip. As we talked more about our memories of the many times we wove into each other's lives over the decades, things we did together, talked about, there were all kinds of discrepancies between our memories. Beyond very different memories of our lifelong relationship, it was plain that in this timeline, we just weren't compatible. Though we finally had the chance to be together, we just weren't resonating, and sadly, we broke our engagement. Soon, after our heartbreaking parting of ways, I went to visit my sister, who always made me feel better. We hadn't had much time to reminisce over the last years, with our parents' illnesses, my dad's death, my romance and its end, and so forth. It was nice to have a chance to talk about our shared history. As we chatted, I commented on the lion collage that I had made for her, which was hanging over her desk. I was sharing my very clear memories of cutting up my dad's many camping catalogs and making different shapes to create this big lion collage for her. I laughed about cutting a whole tent out of a catalog to use as a nose. I said that every time I looked at it above her desk now, I would feel the same slight twinge of annoyance I felt when I made it, realizing that a couple of the lines were off. But my sister looked at me, obviously perplexed, and said that she had equally clear, detailed memories of her and my dad making the collage together as they sat at his desk in our old house. I finally told her about my growing awareness that my memories were not all gelling with the people around me. She had already had a glimpse of this when we discussed the trip that never happened with my ex fiance but now I really opened up about feeling like I was living a different, second life since that fateful day. She knew me and believed what I was saying. We started going through various important family memories, first just the two of us and then the whole family, and it quickly became clear that I had all kinds of different memories than they did. I'm lucky that they were all open-minded and supportive of my experiences. Still, it has been a difficult adjustment. It feels like I've lost an entire lifetime. I really feel for the people here who have gone through this. It creates a terribly unique kind of grief, and there is absolutely nowhere to process it unless you find other true personal accounts like the one shared here. The stories other people have shared about experiences similar to mine have meant so much. Once I learned about it, quantum immortality made a great deal of sense to me. I am an amateur physicist, particularly enthusiastic about theoretical physics, and I can see where my experiences could be perfectly natural if certain current theories are indeed true. I still discover things that I remember differently, things that I remember doing that never happened in this existence or vice versa. There are significant Mandela effects that are dissonant between my memories and those of the larger culture or historical timeline. Interestingly, Things continue to shift, like things that I have done since I woke up after that splitting episode, will change and disappear and then come back again like I'm jumping back and forth. I'd love to hear if other quantum survivors have also experienced this. I'm not asking for anyone to explain this away. I am a trained observer and an academic. This series of events has been an empirical, lived experience for me. I feel like there's nothing to do but embrace it as the way things are. Final notes. One advantage that I've had in this situation is access to good medical care. Since these things started to happen, I've had CT scans, MRIs, exhaustive screenings for mental health issues, dementia, Alzheimer's, brain damage, and batteries of other tests to rule out known psychological and organic causes. All concluded that I am perfectly normal, though I realize the term is somewhat limp in the face of how little human beings know. I currently run an intellectually challenging and rewarding program at a top university, maintain my long-term friendships, remain close to my family, am an author with several books and peer-reviewed papers. I have an advanced black belt and still run my own dojo. I don't mention any of these things to brag. Now more than ever, I realize how connected everything is and how little I have done on my own. All of these achievements rest on my connection to other people who have helped me, 
and the ideas and actions of an infinite web of people. But such achievements are accepted in society as marks of a well-balanced person, though there are obviously notable exceptions if the news is any indication. I list the stable attainments in my life to challenge the notion that people who have these experiences are all unstable crackpots. I cringe when I hear the empty term, crazy. I think that people's experiences with quantum immortality are real and are significant phenomena that we should be paying attention to. I think that the implications are profound in regard to our understanding of life, reality, the universe, everything. I think that everyone here should consider themselves pioneers who've had the opportunity to actually boldly go where few have gone before. I hope people continue to share their stories. The reason it took me so long to fully embrace my perceptions, despite my confidence in them, was that I simply wasn't ready after all that loss to grieve my old life, and further, I literally had no framework from which to reconstruct my orientation towards reality. On this side of things though, I'm actually okay with everything that's happened, and I've started to understand the positive aspects of my experiences. Thank you. Case Notes of File 1286 A Physicist's Perspective on Quantum Immortality So I'm glad you feel this way now, knowing so many other people experience a similar, though not as extreme, version of quantum immortality. And it's true, they do. Thousands, millions of people. I mean, we probably all do at some point in our lives. So really billions. Also, I'm just so incredibly sorry about your parents going through an incurable illness and you having to help them out in that. It's just terrible. Even if quantum immortality is true, it doesn't change the fact that as the survivors, we don't get to jump universes with our loved ones. We're faced with the everlasting lingering here. Honestly, I don't have words for how sorry I am. So many bad things happen to you in such a small period of time. <sighs> it's just truly wrong. The bottle of pills is curious. If you had already completed the transition to a new universe, taking 60 pills wouldn't be survivable in any universe where human physiology matches your original universe. Unless we're like superhuman over there. Maybe in the new one you simply took a smaller dose and flushed the rest in the toilet or something? Would explain why you felt terrible, but you still survived. You were going to go through with it, but you didn't fully commit. And both families not sharing your memory of the first meeting with your partner is very strong evidence of quantum immortality indeed. Sorry that it didn't end up working out. It does make you wonder if soulmates can change depending on the universe you occupy. If the differences in personality are pronounced enough, then I think so. And that isn't to say that soulmates have to be a total match and like, you have to like the same things and think the same way. No, yin and yang. Sometimes we're attracted to the opposite. But if personality does change, it can mean that maybe she was more like you than you wanted. As for constant shifting, I think this could happen if your soul is jumping more than once. It's important to realize that in most accounts, there aren't many differences at all between universes. I like to think of the multiverse as being organized by differences. The more similar two universes are to each other, the greater their proximity. Just speculation, but my guess is, in a soul jump event, you move to the nearest universe where a copy of you that is still alive exists. Sometimes this would be far away, in which case you'd notice more differences. Also, it's pretty cool that you run your own dojo on top of everything. How do you have the time for all that? <laughs> Amazing. And now time for the quote of the day. A sense of humor is part of the art of leadership, of getting along with people, of getting things done. Dwight D. Eisenhower it's not just a military commander, but in any job. Like if you're a manager for uh, even just a fast food chain, you know, Taco Bell or McDonald's or whatever. If the type of managerial skill you have is just being a dictator, in the people that remain, maybe they'll be more efficient, but probably not long term. But you'll get high turnover. You don't want that. You want to be in the muck with people, willing to do the same jobs they are, even as a manager. Humor can alleviate... A lot of friction that can uh, accumulate over time, especially with uh, customer service oriented jobs. So yeah, you want to be there in the muck with your soldiers, so to say. Crack jokes here and there. Don't be too serious. It's a tough balance, but you, you want to be serious enough to get the job done, but also joyful enough and lighthearted enough that not necessarily be friends with those under you, but also just treat them like human. And having jokes is a great way to accomplish that. Or at least laughing at their joke. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony, signing off.